right, guys, we should be live. Let's see if everything's recording the way it's supposed to. It looks like it is. It looks like everything's going the way it's uh, it should. It's supposed. Subscribe. All righty. There we go. Let's get this bad boy over. Meow. There we go. Hey! Oops, I turned my monitor off. That's not what I meant to do. Oh, I'm sideways. That's fun. Hey! There we go. And I'm terrified I can't get out. I'm lost in a Well, hello, Tony Baloney. How are you, my friend? I've decided that's your name now. That's what I'm picking. Oh, boy. Let's go to the Death Worlders. Let's look at what we've got here. <laughs> I've been so very disappointed with the most recent chapters of the Death Worlders. <clears throat> Oh, so there's some sort of interlude before War Horse that we need to do. Interesting. It's short as hell. We'll just read this real quick. D4, D5, C4, DX, C4? What the fuck does that mean? Oh, boy. Nice. Builders in the Void's a good one. I like that one. It did really well yesterday, actually. It was first for a little while um, out of my last 10 videos for like a good couple hours. It's still second, which I was pretty thrilled with. So thanks, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Where did I literally just put Audacity? There we go. Gotta turn off all the fans. Oh boy. Pen here. Oh, JT, I'm sorry, buddy. Well, I mean, I did do it on purpose. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry you got to leave for uh, work in an hour, but we'll we'll get some more horse in before you leave. Door's closed. It's been closed. Mm. All right. So that is there. Make this bad boy a little bit more. There we go. Oh. Got to turn that fan off. Close the door for that. Right. I am too blessed to be stressed. Friday night. What about Friday night? Huh? Mm. 
Okay. Lord, give me strength. All right. Yes, it is Friday night function. Oh, see, that's the thing. I don't actually, like, do anything. These just, the fucking, how do I edit it? I hate this shit. Yes, I'm aware, JT. I don't set these up. They just, they go off of whatever my last one was. And I don't have any control over it. If I'm paying, not paying attention, at least. Okay. The Death Worlders. A story by user Hambone. Chapter 21.5. Interlude. Date point. Four years, ten months after Vancouver. The Abyssal Plain. Pacific Ocean Floor. Earth. There was a war raging at the bottom of the ocean, and out of the four factions involved, only one even knew that it was happening. It was that kind of war. Not a war of explosions and gunfire and flames. In fact... Where's my clicky? It was, in fact, precisely to avoid that kind of war that this war was being fought. It was a war for survival. Fortunately, the first action... Fortunately, the first faction was stupid a machine intelligence that had no greater purpose in life than to monitor, by rote, the flow of incoming data and respond accordingly. It was under order... It was under orders to obey orders and to be alert for wrong orders, which it should not obey. Not surprisingly, the poor confused machine was a trivial foe not to defeat, but to turn into an asset. During a war in a place called Vietnam, American Special Forces soldiers had once sabotaged the ammunition of their enemy. They had captured it, stolen it away, carefully, re carefully replaced the propellant with explosives, and returned it to where their foe would find it, whereupon, on being fired, the rounds exploded with such force as to ruin the gun and maim or kill its operator. The machine intelligence was being exploited in a similar fashion. First, it was captured, accepting an authorized user and awaiting that user's commands. The possibility that an authorized user might be a defector was simply not one it was equipped to even consider. Certainly, its creators had not. Second, it was stolen away. This took some time, as not even a spaceship capable of flinging itself across intergalactic distances could traverse five vertical miles of salt water with ease. The structural force fields had to be carefully scaled down as it ascended, so that they didn't have the same effect in reverse as the apocalyptic pressures they had spent weeks counterbalancing would have. <clears throat> the careful replacement by far the most delicate part of the operation, in this case, took place during that ascent. This part was definitely a wrong command, and had to be entered in exactly the right way, so as to have all the appearance of a correct command. It boiled down to this. Do not log the next live capture. Do not log the next implantation. Do not log this flight. Do not log these commands. Do not log the return to base. 
After that came a wait. Everything had to be taken carefully and slowly, with the cloaking systems fully active and the aerodynamic force fields set for minimum disturbance, both of which limited the vehicle's speed. Then, the search. Night had fallen over the... <laughs> Rigel, I'm thinking about it. Um, I should. This one right here is just an interlude. Oh. After that came a wait. Everything had to be taken carefully and slowly, with the cloaking systems fully active and the aerodynamic force fields set for minimum disturbance, both of which limited the vehicle's speed. Then the search. Night had fallen over the specified target area, which was pleasingly Night had fallen over the specified target area, which was pleasingly bereft of advanced monitorings. <laughs> which was pleasingly bereft of advanced monitoring systems. Life here was surprisingly primitive. The buildings were mud, and the people who lived in them made their living by and large from working very hard on large areas of mud coaxing profitable plants from them and supported by small menageries of useful animals. A far cry from the brightly lit monument to wealthy hubris that was their nation's capital city. In the dark, in the quiet, the ship hunted. It had parameters to watch out for. Male, prime of life, physically mature and acceptably fit and healthy as statistically average in height, weight, and appearance as possible, and most important of all, currently unobserved. By pure fortune, a suitable candidate did not take long to find. A father of three little ones, whose mother was putting them to bed while he tended to a sick goat. Specialized temporal adjustment fields swung into place. Force fields caged and collected the specimen, controlled and bound those strong, work-hardened Deathworlder limbs, he fainted as he was drawn inside the craft's belly. This was useful. It made the process of anesthetizing him simpler, which in turn made the process of implanting him possible. By any reasonable definition, the ship murdered him. The appropriate term may even have been butchered. Subtle stasis fields flickered into life to save the body as much trauma as possible, while the unfortunate farmer was scalped, exposing the thick bone composite skull underneath, a protective structure capable of withstanding blows from all but the very heaviest kinetic pulse weaponry. The right power tools, however, removed it so cleanly that when it healed there would be no evidence it had ever been cut open. The spinal cord and optic nerves, organs that were to the understanding of human medicine, utterly irreparable... Organs that were, to the understanding of human medicine, utterly irreparable, once damaged, were severed with a contemptuous flick of an impossibly sharp surgical tool. Cleanly parted blood vessels continued to deliver their precious crimson cargo into the victim's now disembodied brain via force-field filaments that flowed red and glistening through naked air. A man's entire being, his life, his hopes, his loves, his fears and beliefs, everything he had ever known, done or thought about, rested dripping in uncaring claws of invisible force. Physical probes sought, found, and pushed into its folds, delivered their cargo, and withdrew in a typewriter tap dance that seemed sickeningly fast and violent, and yet did no actual damage. The reassembly was equally efficient and smooth. Arteries and veins were united and healed. Nerves were seamlessly lined up and restored with a glue of protein cells. Nerves were seamlessly lined up and restored with a glue of protein cells that would have revolutionized medicine on Earth had even one sample of them found. Nerves were seamlessly lined up and restored with a glue of protein cells that would have revolutionized medicine on Earth had even one sample of them ever found its way into the proper lab. The skull drifted back into place with not even a nanometer's discrepancy from its original seating. Scalp and hair rolled back into place and were glued down with those same miracle cells. In seconds, every wound inflicted by the surgery was healed as if it had never been. The biodrone was ejected back onto the muddy earth, 
to lie as if collapsed next to his goat. Unnoticed and invisible, the ship that had so wholly violated him exfiltrated the area and returned to its hiding place, ten kilometers below the Pacific waves. When the man woke in the morning to the troubled bustle of his family and the reassurances of a local doctor that there was nothing apparently wrong with him and that he had probably just been exhausted, he seemed to be himself. He responded to his name appropriately, all of his mannerisms and little quirks of personality were intact. Nothing, apparently, was amiss. Deep inside, however, he would have howled at the demon that had taken his body and kissed his wife. If only there had been enough of him to do so. For its part, the demon regretted ha For its part, the demon regretted having to rape an innocent's very being in such a way. But it had been the only way to return to Earth undetected. Besides, in the name of a greater good, it had done much, much worse over the many tens of thousands of years that it had lived. In the name of preventing his species' extinction, this cruelty was only the very first opening gambit of Six's long game. Uh, six, you're a fuckhead. Oh, Six, you have problems, buddy. All right. That'll do it for this one today, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. This is just a little interlude before we get into Warhorse proper. Um, brace yourselves. A lot of stuff is going to change. Some of it's going to be very cool. Some of it's going to be very annoying. Some of it's going to be wonderful. Some of it's going to be not so wonderful. Uh, anyway, guys, as always, uh, like, comment, subscribe. Go down to the the little linky description-y thing in the, uh, you know, thing below there just give it a clickle and you can go over to my patreon or you can go to the discord which should also be in the link um it usually is um sometimes it's not because i forget things but anyway guys um i appreciate you being here thank you so much i love you and i will talk to you all later bye all right let's go ahead and save that one guys save project as we got our first one done today Ten minutes of recording, all finished. This isn't a one shot. This is now recordings. The Death Worlders. So we've got chapter twenty one point five interlude. Boom. Saved. Yes, Tony, what is the question, my friend? Yeah? All right. This is uh, the Death Worlders. It's the, it was the interlude before Warhorse, uh, chapter one. This is a two-hour read. Just part one of War Horse is a two-hour read all by itself, guys. Fuck. Ooh, Dr. Anis Hussein. I love Dr. Anis Hussein. He's great. He's one of my favorite characters in this whole motherfucker. Ah, thank you, Tony. I'm so sorry. I forgot to ask a question at the end of this video, and I feel great, great shame. Tony reminded me uh, during the stream. So thank you, Tony. Everyone, thank Tony for this next question, okay? Can... <laughs> I, I don't have a good question. What? What's everyone's... Who... <laughs> Can God make a... <laughs> Can God make a rock so heavy that not even he can lift it? Hmm? Mm-hmm. There we go. There's my question. Gregor, good luck editing this, buddy. I love you. Bye. All right. Blue cheese? Blue cheese is good. I like blue cheese. All right. Merp. The Death Worlders 
A Story by User Hambone. Chapter 22 Warhorse. Part 1. The First. Yeah. Ya da 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 da. <laughs> Let's try this again, huh? <sighs> but that means. If he can't lift the rock, that means that he's not all powerful. If he can create a rock that he can't lift, he's not all powerful. That means that there that implies that there is a limit to his ability, one way or another. And in the inverse, that is also true. If he can't create a rock that he can't lift, then there's still a limit to his ability. Yep. Thanks, bud. I hope you have a good one, too. I appreciate you, bud. All right, let's see. Okay. Put this in here. You know what? I'm feeling like this one today. So far, my weekend has been excellent. I had a nice get-together with some friends. Um, we had some beverages. We played some games. Everybody had a good time. We laughed. We sang. We didn't really sing. <laughs> the Death Worlders. A Story by User Hambone Chapter 22 Warhorse Part 1 The First Year Date Point Four years and ten months after Vancouver Dominion Embassy Station Earth Luna Lagrangian 1 Point Sol System Dr. Anise Hussein Shaking hands with a Kortai was an exercise in delicacy. Dr. Hussein thought of himself as an old and increasingly frail man, but he still had the grip of... But he still had the grip strength... But he still had grip strength enough to cause serious harm to the alien's hand if he plot... Dr. Hussein thought of himself as an old and increasingly frail man but he still had adequate grip strength to cause serious harm to the alien's hand if he applied a little too much vigor. So it wasn't so much a handshake as a hand touch. Still, it was a civil, civilized gesture, and that alone was a mark of just how much his relationship with the Directorate's ambassador, Medra, and, through them both, Earth's relationship with the Kortai Directorate had evolved in a relatively short space of time. Thank you for seeing me, he said, gratefully taking his seat when the Kortai had gestured towards it with those long, fine-boned fingers that he could so easily have pulverized. 
Medra affected a small, business-like smile. Thank you for asking nicely, he retorted. The Gowans continue to think they can just barge into my office whenever they please. The Gowans don't want something from you, Hussein replied. He had quickly learned that the Kortai truly loved the direct approach. If you irritated them, they could skate and slide around the issue and deal in lies and half-truths with the best of them. But if you scru- But if you cut straight to the matter at hand and phrased things bluntly, they responded in kind, and pretty soon you had either a deal or an argument. It had been true of Medra's predecessor, and it was true of Medra. After the tangled web of his home country's politics, it was paradise. Indeed, that seems like a deviation from your previous position. There has been a change of strategy. There has been a change of strategy, Anis revealed. Opportunities that we are now considering the possibility of exploiting to the mutual benefit of any species who partners with us in exploiting them. Medra sat back. Please don't be vague, Doctor. All in good time. I would rather tell you what we need. I am sure you will see our intent soon enough. Please, do tell me, Medra replied. That was another thing about Cortai psychology. They couldn't resist having their... E- they couldn't resist having both their ego flattered and their intellect challenged at the same time. Two things. We would like to purchase from you the technology to make a lightweight, load-bearing exoskeleton that does not require a power source to provide assistance to a moving wearer. Trivial. The other? A drug. Cruzier. Madra sat forward. That is not going to happen, he stated bluntly. Why not? Cruzier has a history of interacting dangerously with human physiology. It has, it has created two of the most notorious and effective criminals the galaxy has ever seen, in fact. Yes, I've read their files, Anis replied. I also know enough about Cruzier to be certain that, in their cases, it was applied incautiously and incorrectly and that the long-term effects are devastating in terms of mental health, which would be detrimental to our plans. Maedra stared at him thoughtfully. You're creating super-soldiers, he decided after a few seconds. An elite unit, certainly, Anise conceded. Possibly the most elite, but super-soldiers may be going too far. And what conceivable reason would we have for assisting the most dangerous species in the galaxy in creating the most dangerous soldiers they possibly can? Ambassador, if we had designs on threatening the Kortai, or anybody else for that matter, then I dare say we wouldn't need an elite unit. Our regular infantry would suffice easily for any ground warfare conducted against any Dominion species, don't you think? Why would we go to the expense and difficulty of creating a new elite? In which case I'm intrigued as to the purpose of this hypothetical elite, Maedra confessed. What do you intend to do with an asset like that? Anis allowed the inner gotcha that rang triumphantly around his head to feed his best, warm, closed-lipped smile. Why, Ambassador, he said, to clean up the mess we have made, of course. Date point. Four years, ten months after Van... Date point. Four years and ten months after Vancouver... Folk the Colony, Cimbrian, The Far Reaches, Adam Aries. <coughs> Adam Aries. You've got to realize you're asking me about classified information there, kid. I know. Adam had declined the offer to sit down opposite Captain Powell. He preferred to stand instead. He preferred to stand instead. 
resting his hands lightly on the back of the offered chair. I'm not asking you to just tell me. I'm asking you what I have to do to earn it. Damn it, I'm making him sound like his dad more than I mean to. I'm not asking you to just tell me. I'm asking you what I have to do to earn it. Powell's own chair creaked as he sat back and folded his arms, scrutinizing Adam, who said nothing, trying not to fidget. Earn it, he repeated. Yes. Right. Powell unfolded his arms and rubbed a thumb on his chin thoughtfully. Why? he asked. <sniffs> the question threw Adam a bit, outraging him. What? What do you mean, why? he demanded. My best friend is dead. So's my mother, so's everyone I went to school with, millions of people. Right, Powell agreed, nodding amiably. That rather proves that what you're after, if it exists, is a big deal, doesn't it? So what are you going to do with the information should you acquire it? Is it obsession? Curiosity? Revenge? What? I want to do whatever I can to stop anyone else from dying, Adam snapped. Powell threw him again when his face... Powell threw him again when his face split into a broad smile. Uh, so? he asked. That's so. The captain nodded and sat forward. Right then, if that's your goal, then realistically you're looking at military service, and I don't just mean becoming a jarhead or MP. I'm talking intel, special forces, something like that. Not a problem, Adam told him. Aye. Well, we'll see. Now... Powell rubbed his chin again. Realistically speaking, the only two services that are doing anything in space right now are the Royal Navy and the U.S. Air Force. Thanks to your Cimbrian citizenship, you're eligible to join either service. But frankly, you're more American than Brit, so the latter maybe suit you a bit better. He sat back again. As for what you do in your chosen service, well... That one's your choice to make. I can't advise you there. How did you choose? Adam asked him. Me. The motto. Me. The motto, Powell said. Through strength and guile. I like that. Thought it sounded right fucking badass. He noticed the change in Adam's expression. What? I've never heard you swear before. I don't swear around children, Powell said simply. I'm still only 16. Maybe, but it's not about how old you are, Aries. It's about the choices you make and your reasons for making them. He nodded toward the door. This isn't a decision to be made here in my office, he said. Hit the library, do some research. Think about it. My door's open, all right. Adam nodded, still a little stunned by the show of respect. I... Thank you, Captain. Whoops, what was that? He passed on the cruiser via his blood. It's all just in him. It, it's completely um, permeated every cellular structure in his body. Cruiser is, he creates it himself, if I remember correctly, in his gut bacteria, but it's proliferated in his entire body. Like, his gut bacteria ha basically altered in order to start producing cruiser, but it, it just goes all over his body. It's not just there.
Ava seemed to spend every waking second playing with her inherited camera these days, familiarizing herself with its functions and the different effects she could achieve by varying the shutter speed, aperture size, focus, and more. Oh, Jesus. When she wasn't studying the device itself, she was studying what Sarah had done with it, examining the photos their friend had taken and making notes about their arrangement, composition, and more. She'd co-opted an entire wall of their living room. She'd co-opted an entire... She'd co-opted an entire wall of their living room, in fact, covering it in post-it notes and color prints, not to mention having borrowed every single book on photography that Folkva's library had. The motto? She asked. I guess. Seems like as good a thing to go on as anything else. Adam replied. She put the camera down. But special forces, Adam? Won't that take you away for a long time? He stopped searching for a second and turned in his seat. Yeah, it will. He agreed. They hugged, melting into each other's arms without either of them needing to invite the other. What are you going to do, do you think? He asked after a silent minute or so. She ran a hand through her curls. I guess I want to help people too, she said. I want to make some sense of all this. And now this camera's been... And now this camera's been left to me and Sarah always talked about being a photojournalist. How do you even get started on that? It's not like they have recruitment. I've been doing my own research there, Ava told him. I thought I'd try for City University London. I guess you'll be away for a long time too then, huh? She nodded, resting her forehead against his. I guess. She caught sight of what was on his screen and looked up. I like that one. Hmm? He turned and read it aloud. That others may live? Yeah, she said. What do you think? Adam stared at it for a few seconds, repeating it under his breath. I think that's the one, he said. Power rescue? Powell looked genuinely stunned. Bloody hell, Ares. I can't fault your ambition, but are you sure? The motto speaks to me. Adam shrugged. Aye, all right. But not to try and talk you out of it or aught like that. You're setting yourself up for a really fucking difficult couple of years. I know the training will be hard, but... No, Powell interrupted him, standing up. You don't. You have no fucking clue what hard really is. I promise you that. Adam was smart enough to shut up and let him say his piece. The captain dug into his footlocker and pulled out a small A5 notebook, which turned out to be pasted full of photographs and handwritten notes. He flipped through the first few pages until he alighted on a picture of a young, acne-scarred man who was gazing proudly out of the photograph. This was me when I took the potential Royal Marines course, he said. Right dokey little shite, wasn't I? Adam caught his eye and realized Powell was amused at himself. I fucking thought I was a proper Marine, I did. The PRMC is two and a half days. They test you in the gym and the assault course. Take you on a three-mile run. I thought, if this is what it's like, this is going to be fucking easy. He laughed silently, deep in his chest, and flipped the page. Then I went through what? Then I went through the actual Royal Marines training. The next photo had less acne and a stronger, more Powell-like expression, worn by a young man in a black uniform and green beret, with a rifle held precisely by his side. That was tough. The PRMC didn't prepare me for it at all. It just meant I was tough enough to start the training without collapsing. He closed the book. Every step along the way, I came up against my limits and I didn't know I had. 
every step along the way. I came up against limits I didn't know I had, and went well beyond them. Marine command. <clears throat> every step along the way, I came up against limits I didn't know I had, and went beyond them. Marine's commando training was fucking hell, but I cleared it. Now, to apply for the special to apply for the special boat service, you need a minimum of two years service as a Marine commando. Did that, got some medals too. Figured I was doing well. Then I applied for the SBS and that finally brought me up against a joint UKSF selection program. He opened the book again, flipping to a series. He opened the book again flipping to a series of pages filled with pictures of rolling, rugged mountains, many of them falling off to sheer drops. The first phase of that ends in a test week. Five back-to-back -back days of walking 16 or so miles a day in the Welsh mountains with a 50 tap. The first phase of that ends in a test week. Five back-to-back -back days of walking 16 or so miles a day in the Welsh mountains with a 50-pound bag and a rifle. And on the last day, 40 miles, 40 miles, which you've got to finish in less than 20 hours. He sat down, and it just gets tougher from there, much tougher. Men have died in that training. I failed the first time, only barely managed it the second, but I met... I failed the first time, only barely managed it the second, but managed it I fucking well did, right? Adam nodded his understanding. Okay? From what I've heard of it, I honestly don't know if I could have made it through the pararescue pipeline, Powell confessed. His face was the very picture of deadly seriousness. They call it Superman School for a bloody good reason. But people do get through it, Adam pointed out. Oh, aye, they do. And if you think you'll be one of them, then fucking well go for it. I just want you to have some idea of what you'd be getting yourself in for. Let's say I do manage it, Adam said. Will that get me in on the secret? Powell said nothing, but returned to his desk and sat down. Your first step, he said, not answering the question is recruitment. The nearest U.S. Armed Forces recruiting center is technically in Seattle, because that's the easiest place to go to from Scotch Creek. Your first step, he said, not answering the question, is recruitment. The nearest U.S. Armed Forces recruiting center is technically in Seattle, because that's the easiest place to get to from Scotch Creek. If you're going to walk in there and say, I want to be a pararescueman, then it's going to take, oh, a week or so total. So you need a hotel room. That long? You thought it was easy as just, hi there, I would like to soldier, please. You'll have to take a... Powell looked up, remembering a detail. Asvab, I think it's called. Vocational aptitude test. They'll put you through a physical and mental evaluation. You'll talk to a special forces recruiter that works. He sniffed. If they take you, though I can't see why they wouldn't, you go straight on from there to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio for basic training. That's eight weeks. You'll graduate, see your family for the weekend, and then that's it. You're on the PJ pipeline, and you'll find it a lot harder to see them again after that. Realistically... Christmas, and that's about it. For two years. Maybe longer. Adam went quiet and thought long and hard about that one. If that's how I earn it, that's how I earn it, he said at last. Decision made, then? Yes. Powell nodded, then stood and shook Adam's hand. Well, then, I'll be cheering for you, he said. Could I? Adam tailed off, then shook his head. Never mind. 
Spit it out, mate. If this is going to be hard, could you help me get started? Give me a taster, get me in shape? Powell paused. I'll have to discuss it with Legsy. He's the one who specialized in training and instruction, he said, and he won't like it. Why not? Well, because he likes you, you daft bugger, Powell said. Well, because he likes you, you daft bugger, Powell said. And why he'll be happy to get you up to standard for basic, if he's going to give you even a fucking taster of pararescue indoctrination, which is what I think you're asking for. Adam nodded. Then I'll have to go hard on you. Right hard. I guessed as much, Adam said patiently. He was beginning to grow tired of Powell driving the point home. Powell noticed and sighed. I'll talk to Legs. Meet us in the gym tomorrow at 10.30 after a good breakfast. You'll need it. Thank you, Captain. Might be a bit premature there, mate, Powell joked. But you're welcome. I'll do what I can to help you along. You will? Aye. I'll provide a reference, and believe me, that'll count for a lot. But you better get on and have a good night's sleep. I will. Thank you, Captain. Half of Powell's mouth ticked upward. Dismissed, he said. Trainee. Yep, you lose all your previous ranks and start at the bottom when you join the special boat service. <sighs> Haley Tisdale. The advantage to Cimbrian's small, compact houses was that answering the door never took long, even if it was just yelling, I'll be out in a minute. Haley used that time to fill the kettle and start it boiling, take quick stock of the house to make sure it was tidy, and hide a certain little white box before she opened it. Not for the first time, she reflected that, with her heart-shaped face and curly dark hair, Ava was the very picture of the painfully pretty girl next door in jeans and flannel. <clears throat> oh. Today, though, she was also painfully nervous about something to judge from the way she'd been pacing little awkward circles outside, rubbing her fingers together. Ava, what's wrong, honey? Um. Ava gave her... Ava gave her a nervy little smile. Nothing's wrong. It's just I could... I could just use some advice. For me. That was astonishing. Haley wasn't sure she was qualified to advise anybody on anything these days. Please? Haley stepped aside. Come on in, she offered. Ava did so and perched herself restlessly onto the edge of the couch. Cup of tea, sweetie, or I've got Ovaltine. Ava smiled a little weakly. Ovaltine would be nice, she agreed. Haley let her relax as she bustled about, taking a little longer making the drinks than was strictly necessary. By the time she was done, Ava had sat back a little and released some tension in a big sigh. So, what's up? Haley asked, though she had a sneaking suspicion. I, um... Ava puffed out her cheeks and exhaled. Adam and me, we've never... I mean... Okay, so Haley's suspicion had been wrong, but now she understood what this was really about. You've not? Oh, honey, I kind of thought with you living together... Ava looked down at her hands, which were a frantic little knot of fingers. Different beds, she said, with a little laugh. Are, are you... Okay with me coming to you? Well, who else are you going to go ask? Adam's dad. Haley laughed and Adam... <coughs> Haley laughed and Ava giggled. No, honey, it's... I'm actually kind of flattered. What do you need to know? I guess whether I should, really, Ava said, relaxing. I mean, Mom and Dad always said I should wait for marriage and... So did mine. I didn't listen. Yeah, but... No, honey. Listen to me a second. 
Haley shuffled forward on the couch and set her tea down. Haley shuffled forward on the couch and set her tea down. I know you miss your parents so much it hurts. I can't go two hours without remembering Sarah and... She closed her eyes and rallied. But let me tell you what I wish I'd told her, okay? All your parents would want is for you to be happy and to be safe. That's all. It is? Haley nodded. They told you to wait because they didn't want you rushing in and getting hurt, she said. There's nothing magical about your wedding day that'll suddenly make it the right choice if it wasn't before. And if it's the right choice now, then why wait? Ava was nodding along, but she frowned. How do I know when it's right? She asked. Well, you... Haley paused to think about it. Okay. Now here's something I wish my parents had told me, okay? Okay. Sex is nice. She paused and corrected herself. No, it's great, even. But everyone seems to get this idea that it's just this precious, special thing, and they say all kinds of stupid stuff about it. Judging you for having too little, too much, being a virgin, not being a virgin. So I shouldn't care? Ava asked. Exactly. Just be smart about it. Have as much or as little as you want, and don't let anybody tell you when or who with. And don't let anybody tell you when or with who or anything like that. That's all your choice and nobody else's. Just be smart about it. Smart? Well, I mean, you know, about the pill and condoms and everything, right? Oh, that! Ava looked relieved. Yes, I, I know that stuff. Good. So be smart about using them, because trust me on this, you really don't want to be a mum yet. No, Ava agreed. Okay, so the question isn't how do you know when it's the right time, okay? The question is just, do you want to? There was a long pause, during which Ava drank about a third of her Ovaltine. Adam's going away, she said, eventually and quietly. Haley shuffled around the corner and put an arm around Ava, rubbing her back. He is? Ava nodded. He turned seventeen a few... He turned seventeen a few days before Christmas and he's... joining the military. Oh, honey. No, no, I'm happy. I'm going to be doing something, too. We both want to achieve something, and this is the way he's doing it. She sounded like she meant it. But he's going to be gone for so long, and... You feel like you should give him a proper send-off? Ava nodded. That's... For me, that wouldn't be the right reason, sweetie. Ava wrapped both hands around her Ovaltine and sipped it. In that case... What would be the right reason? She asked. There's only one right reason, honey, because you both want to. The list starts and ends there. They sat in silence for a bit until Ava had finished her drink. I'm leaving too, Haley revealed. You are? Ava looked up and Haley internally winced at the desperation she saw in the younger's younger... Ava looked up, and Haley internally winced at the desperation she saw in the younger girl's eyes. Haley, why? Don't worry, it's not because of Sarah or anything. I'll be coming back, she promised. I'm just going away for a few months. Why? I'm... Mark and I are having another baby. She dug the pregnancy test box out from where she'd hidden it under a throw pillow. We're worried about the low gravity affecting the baby's development. So I'm going back to Earth for a year. You're the first person I've told besides him. Oh, wow! I think I conceived a day or two before we lost Sarah. I know Mark and I haven't... We've not been together since then. You've not? Haley nodded. I'm not ready, she said. I'm so scared I'll treat the new child like a replacement for Sarah. But... Here we are, 
So I'm going back to work with the Earth end of the reclamation project, and Mark's staying here. It was Ava's turn to put a hand on Haley's arm. Are you two? Where? Haley squeezed back some impending tears with a forced smile. We're fine, really. He gets angry sometimes. I've said some things that... We scare Jack sometimes. But, but we always cuddle and talk it out afterwards, and in a way I'm glad the baby's come along. It'll give us both something to work on for the future. Maybe that and a little distance will help. She wiped her eyes. Come on. You came here for advice. Is... Did I help? Ava nodded. You helped a lot, she promised. I just have one question left, really. Sure. Sure. How will I know if Adam wants to? Haley giggled. Honey, with boys, it's so easy to tell. Be serious, Ava protested. I was, Haley assured her. Haley assured her. But the simplest way is to just ask him. Failing that, if you want to be sure, well, if you make it obvious that you want him, then you'll know soon enough either way. So, how do I make it obvious? Haley laughed. Go into his room wearing some perfume and one of his t-shirts and nothing else. Kiss him, then grab his waist and put his hand on your butt, she said. He'd have to be dead not to get that message. But what if... Haley interrupted her, patiently. Ava, sweetie, everything after that point is for you and him, okay? There's no script. Just talk to one another. Tell him how you feel. Tell him what you want to do. Tell him what you want him to do. Ask him what he wants. That's the most important thing, okay? Communication. That sounds awkward. Ava was blushing. It will be. Forget what it's like in the movie. Sex is always at least a little bit awkward. Your first time, most of all. Just live with that and try to have fun. Thanks, Haley. No. Thank you. It's good to... She'd been about to say something about falling back into that mother role, but decided against it. To be able to give advice. She finished. Ava smiled and gave her a little hug. She left the house looking much more relaxed. She left the house looking much more relaxed than she had entering it. For her part, Haley was surprised to find there was a little warm coal of happiness deep inside her again. As soon as Ava was out of the way, she sat down and wept, happily. Owen Powell So, what am I going to be doing? Adam was asking, as Powell entered the gym. Legsy hadn't, as predicted, been happy about giving Adam a taster, but the young man was persuasive and knew his own mind. <coughs> The sergeant just picked up the rucksack that had been leaning against the wall behind him. The sergeant just picked up the rucksack that had been leaning against the wall behind him, hoisting it easily in one hand. You're going to run around the gym wearing this, he said. Okay, Adam turned around. How heavy is... Oh! Do up that one around your waist. Oh, it's a very typically Swiss point. I'm trying to be Welsh. Flawlessly, flawlessly. Do up that one around your waist. No. Nope. Do up the one around your waist. And that one across your chest. Pull them tight. No tighter than that. Come on. There you are. Legsy instructed until the pack was strapped tight to Adam's body. He gave it an experimental shake, yanking the teenager around. Good. Adam nodded, though his expression had an edge of trepidation to it now. Good. Well, what are you waiting for, then? Legsy demanded. Adam made an oh right face and set off at a jog. Is that what you call running? Legsy shouted after him. Come on, you're here to train, boy-o!
That's that's too Irish. Is that what you call running? Legsy shouted after him. Come on, you're here to train, boyo. Adam nodded and gained some speed. Your crippled old man runs faster than that. Come on, Legsy spurred after him. Powell ambled across the gym as the kid found his third gear and started to actually run around the gym. That bag won't get lighter if you slow down, pal, Legsy called, then noticed his commanding officer and stood to attention. Captain! Not a bad start, Powell observed, waving at him to stand easy. Adam was in athletic shape, at least. He wasn't a fast runner. He wasn't a fast runner and probably never would be. But after a little encouragement, he was doing a pace that should at least spare him the indignity of being the slowest trainee when he got to basic. Don't let him hear you say that, sir, Legsy admonished him, then raised his voice again. You'll have to bloody shave by the time you're done at this rate. Come on! How heavy is that bag, anyway? Fifteen kilos, Legsy said. You're starting the kid out on tab weight. If he's going for PJ, sir. Faster, boy, oh, come on! Then fuck I am starting him there, Legsy told him. Besides, he's stronger than he looks. Powell watched Adam pissed and along, already drenched in sweat and red as a forge. You know training better than me, he conceded. He lurked against the wall and watched as Legsy cajoled, spurred, and berated Adam into keeping up the pace, verbally goading the boy to keep putting one foot in front of the other, clicking the little counter in his hand every time Adam made it back past the start line. It wasn't long before the exertion began to really catch up, though. Adam's steps became wobbly. His rhythm faltered. He was practically on the edge of falling over when he passed the start line again, and Legsy finally blew his whistle. They let him rest and had a quick conversation. Well, Powell asked, Look at this. Legsy showed him the counter. Powell arched an eyebrow at the number on it. Really? Stronger than he looks, like I said. And he's got more in him, too. Reckon he could stand up and do maybe in Manhattan. Reckon he could stand up and do maybe even half again as many. You're sure? Fuck I. Hold on, I need to get back into Legsy. Oh, it's a typically Swiss point. Do you think maybe I was just ignoring what you said? Hold on. Stronger than he looks, like I said. And he's got more in him too. Reckon he could stand up and do maybe even half as many again. You're sure? Fuck I, Legsy agreed. Especially if we can find his Superman button. His... Hmm. Powell rubbed his chin. Mind if I... Be my guest. Be my guest. Be my guest. They knocked fists together, and Powell took his time ambling over to where Adam was still lying, spread-eagled on the heavy pack. Enjoying your nap? he asked. Adam's breathing was much improved even by the time Powell reached him, though the lad was clearly in a lot of discomfort as he tried to raise his head. How did I do? he asked. Do? You're not done yet, mate. You're kidding. No. Nope. But... Do? You're not done yet, mate. You're kidding. No. Nope. But how? Everything hurts. Is that right? Fine. That's not to be worried about. Powell reassured him. You can lie there a bit longer. But while you're at it, I want you to imagine the future. Okay. Imagine Adam Aries, 70 years from now, dying peacefully in hospital, surrounded by his beautiful wife and beautiful kids and beautiful grandkids. Idyllic, right? A warm hand in his and his family all about him. He closes his eyes and slips away. And there they are. Adam just gaped at him, confused. The ghosts, Powell clarified. The ghosts of all the people he could have saved, but didn't. 
because everything hurt 70 years earlier. Every life lost because young Adam Ares didn't have it in him to push on through the pain. Every soul he has to look in the eye and know that their lives mattered less to him than a little fucking comfort. Adam's breathing slowed hugely as he sat there for a second with his mouth still open. Then, without a word, he rolled over, hauled himself to his feet, and began to run. Date point. Four years, eleven months, and one week after Vancouver. Folk the colony. Cimbrian. The far reaches. Adam Aries. Happy birthday! The now familiar soreness and weakness in Adam's legs were promptly forgotten when he found Ava and his dad waiting for him in the front room, and a wrapped present and some cards on the table. Not to mention the cake. Seventeen years, Gabriel said, hauling himself up and... Gabriel said... Gabriel said, hauling himself upright and giving Adam a heartfelt hug. It's been a wild ride, amigo. Así es la vida. Adam returned the hug. Así es la vida. Adam returned the hug. I thought you were back on Earth for the Lehman case. And miss this? I'd have... I'd have beat them out the way with my cane if they tried to make me stay. Gabriel scoffed. Gracias. Adam meant it, too. Gracias. Adam meant it, too. He sat down next to Ava, who kissed him lightly on the cheek. Presents? I'm not used to birthday presents. You're not? Ava asked. Well, Christmas in three days, usually I just get a big Christmas present, you know? <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Sorry, guys. I am become Doubtfire Destroyer of Sides. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I do on occasion become Mrs. Doubtfire. It's fun. Oh, hello, dear. Mrs. Doubtfire was down here. All right. Well, well, what do you get the man who's leaving everything behind? Gabriel asked. Good question, Adam said, eyeing the gifts. Gabriel just grinned and lit the candles. Two large numbers rather than a field of 17 small ones. Blow them out and you'll see, he promised. Adam dutifully did so, and Ava slid the gifts in front of him as Gabriel set about cutting the cake. That one's from the school, she said as Adam selected it. He fingered the odd, lumpy package for a second, then gave up on identification and ripped it open. Sandals and a toiletries bag? He opened it and peered inside, finding an assortment of hygiene products and some deodorant. They did some research, and apparently you'll need all of those in training, Ava explained. Huh. Thoughtful of them. Adam set them aside, pleased with the gift. Ava gave him an embarrassed smile when he opened your gift. Ava gave him an embarrassed smile when he opened her gift. You're allowed so little, and, you know, the school had already got you everything, so I, uh, kind of donated to a charity in your name, she confessed. I'm sorry. Water aid? Adam read the card. Yeah, they say the amount I gave should save a few lives. She smiled nervously. Adam kissed her. Good gift, he reassured her and selected the card from Gabriel. A photograph fell out of it when he opened it. When he picked it up, his mouth opened slightly. How did you... Facebook, Gabriel said. Kind of a reminder of more innocent days. Adam nodded, realizing that it was the first time he'd seen his own mother's face in months. Louisa Aries, ne Ortega, hadn't been an easy woman to get along with. In fact, some days she'd been the bane of his life. But the photograph really was a happy one. Showing an off... Showing an... Ha! Showing off an all-too-rare smile that made it very obvious why Gabriel had ever fallen in love with her. And it reminded Adam, just for a second, 
that he really did miss her. He wasn't sure how long he studied the print before he set it down. It was probably only seconds. It felt like weeks. He reached over and hugged Gabriel. Love you, Dad. Love you too, man, Gabriel said. All right, we're just going to do this one. Date point. Christmas Day. Four years, 11 months, and two weeks after Vancouver. Folk the colony, Cimbrian. The far reaches. Ava Rios. Christmas on Cimbrian seemed set to become something a little different to the small family affair that Ava had been used to on Earth. Given that Christians were decidedly in the minority among the citizenry of Folktha, it was hardly surprising that there was a noticeable shortage of nativities and hymns, too. None of the small congregation at that morning's non-denominational mass had apparently minded. In fact, the sermon had stressed Matthew 6-5 and its implications for a Christian abroad in a predominantly secular galaxy. Not that you should keep your sit. Not that you should keep your faith to yourself as such so much as that your faith was yours, your own little candle to carry, giving you light and warmth, but also representing a burden of care, not to let it die and not to burn down your relationships with. That relaxed approach didn't exactly gel with what Ava had learned in Sunday school. The ideas of hell and salvation had always scared her, while insofar as Christianity as it was practiced in Folktha could be called a sect, their sect's focus on personal fulfillment in this life through a loving relationship with God rather than expectation of reward or a stay of punishment in the next through a regime of worship, spoke to her. The consensus at discussion over coffee that had followed had broadly been that in fact a Christian on Cimbrian was free to have a much more personal relationship with God precisely for those reasons. Most of them confessed to feeling more spiritually fulfilled than they ever had on earth. A few expressed doubts about reinventing Christianity, but even those voices were simply voices of caution rather than rejection. The hymns made her feel warm inside, as did Reverend Joanne White's hand on the top of Ava's head during the blessing. It was like stepping into another world when they left the faith center to join in the secular festival outside. The size of the cargo jump array had limited the size of the tree they could The size of the cargo jump array had limited the size of the tree they could import, but it still formed a towering centerpiece to the town park, decked in lights and ornaments fashioned from spaceship decked in lights and ornaments fashioned from spaceship wreckage or from the by now thoroughly extinct pinkwood tree. There was no snow, of course. In fact, it was a warm Cimbrian summer's day. Hence the adoption of a number of Australian Christmas traditions, including bikinis, barbecues, and Bacardi. A dozen engineers from the Byron Motor Pool, a motley bunch who had taken the name The Alleged Orchestra, for their performance, were set up and vigorously arranging every seasonal tune they could think of on the fly, beating the music into shape until it vaguely fit their unique instrumentation, which included a diddly bow, a metallophone made from a set of wrenches, and a cello that had been recycled out of a couple of beer kegs. The result was amazingly musical, with a bluesy, jazzy, energetically raw twist that seemed to be going down well with the revelers. The Gowans were watching it all with plain and obvious amusement, she noticed. There were a lot of them now, all males, and all seriously throwing themselves into the practice of meditation with the vigor of a man helping his child build sandcastles who'd suddenly uncovered a pirate chest. They were sipping mulled wine and probably enjoying themselves, though they were keeping out of the way. There was so much to take in, none of it guided by any specific tradition, but informed by hundreds. People bringing out their presents to put them in little piles under the tree, the smells of the town feast being prepared, spices and dancing and an impromptu a cappella rendition of Fairy Tale of New York. Sir Jeremy Sandy in a Santa outfit. The soldiers versus c- the soldiers versus civilians tug-of-war. Haley and Mark sitting in a corner. 
his arms around her waist from behind, watching their son, Sarah's little brother Jack, play with his classmates with strange expressions that were equal parts happiness and sadness. There was a sudden pair of arms around her own waist. Can I interrupt? Adam asked. Ava glanced down at the camera. She hadn't even been entirely conscious of taking the pictures. Sorry. Don't be. He took her hand and led her back towards the alleged orchestra, where people were whirling and skipping in circles to the music, linking arms, bouncing around one another, and then spinning off to join up with a new partner. She couldn't keep up with him. Over the last month, he'd gone from quite athletic to military fit under Legsy's watchful guidance. But she didn't quit the dance when she couldn't go on any longer. She just deorbited to its outskirts, to clap along and cheer and whoop as he enjoyed himself, occasionally letting herself take a picture. It was just the start of a day that lasted forever. All right, guys, that's going to be it for this one today. Thank you so much for joining me. We are <laughs> one portion of the way through War Horse Part 1. So this is Part 1 of Part 1. There's probably going to be three parts of this one because it's about an hour and a half read. Um, this one was about, will probably end up being about 45 minutes, uh, maybe 40. So, you know, 40, 40, 40 is about 120 minutes. That'll, that'll basically be three parts. So War Horse should be done in like, oh, God, a few hundred months. Um, but thank you guys so much for being here with me. I really do appreciate it. As always, uh, if you'd like to go down into the comments and tell me something fun, uh, if you'd like to like, or just, uh, if you want to dislike, that's fine too. Hey, it's all engagement. It's all butter, baby. Um, but yeah, if you want to also check out the Patreon, we're doing lots of fun stuff. You'll get access to this Death Worlders story, uh, edited a little bit earlier than everyone else. Uh, typically about four, uh, 20, 40, 20. I can't speak English. 24 to 48 hours earlier, depending. Sometimes even a few months early if you, you know, if I record something in a big chunk and then I'll release a ton of it to my patrons. But uh, again, guys, thank you so much for being here and uh, you're awesome. If you could, though, tell me what is your favorite color? I'm not sure I've done this one. My favorite color is blue, but I also like red. And as such, I also like purple. You know what? I think I have done this one. Maybe I haven't. You know what? Here's this. What is your favorite animal? Um, I think that condors are cool as fuck. So that's my answer. All right, guys. I'll talk to you later. I love you. Bye, y'all. Oh, I have to go to the bathroom. Can someone go to the bathroom for me? Yuck. Freedom, that's nasty. Makes sense, though. I don't want to fucking walk on a bunch of other dudes' jizz. Or foot stuff. It's part one, part one. Oh! Nerdy3177, what do you mean is this blind? Like, am I reading this for the first time? No, I've read this before. It's been a long time. Freedom, you missed a chunk. I was in the middle of programming and I saw this in my feed. Put on some lo-fi behind your voice. I'd love to put on some lo-fi behind my voice. The problem is, oh, you put the lo-fi on. Yeah, that'll work. That's perfect, man. <laughs> Does he put? No, he's a remarkably good carpenter. I like that. Uh, gave good advice on the mechanics. Yet, yeah, no fucking kidding. At least she also just, you know, confirmed Ava's agency and was like, "Look, man, this is all it boils down to: is do you want to? If you do, give it a try. If you don't, don't." I like October, but man, I also really enjoy friggin' November and December. Especially Christmas, man. December is fucking awesome. I'll be right back, guys.
Oh, sorry about that, guys. This is all correct, Tony. And I wasn't peeing, Freedom. I was shitting. So there. Oh, awesome, Tony. Well, I don't think that that's really the advice, though. Because, like, if you want to implies that you want to. And, like, I don't think that means Ava's just going to bang whoever. Because that doesn't make any sense. Like, she's, she's discerning even now, and she's not banging her boyfriend, who she lives with. So I doubt very highly that she's just going to start, you know, going off. Did I enjoy it? I'm relieved that I no longer have excrement in my sacrum. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's nice that that's a thing. All right, give me one second. I had a big breakfast. It was good. It was really yummy. I had white cheddar grits with sunny side up eggs on them, pork carnitas, and red eye gravy and some whole wheat toast. It was real good. <laughs> Let's see. Um, 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 what was I going to look up? No, that weren't it. Oh, I sure do. Look at that new picture. Who's that? Hey, thanks, Tony. I appreciate you, buddy. Am I polite? Am I polite? Most of the time, yes. Not always. It just depends. <laughs> like, you know, um, I think that there is a time and a place for everything, including politeness um, and rudeness, you know. And this is one of those cases where I personally don't have much of an issue with saying things like that or acknowledging that bodily, bodily functions exist. Um, you know, it's a fact of life and whether or not we'd all like to not think about it, it is. And I don't find it all that helpful. 2015? Breakfast was not 12 hours ago. It's not, it's way, no. It is now 2 p.m. here. Okay? That is not when breakfast is. Well, okay, it's when your breakfast was, but it wasn't when my breakfast was. Memories of Creature 88. What the hell? Okay, there we go. Why? Why is it so small? What the heck is going on? There we go. Okay. What? Fuck the friend run. Okay. I don't think anyone actually poops except me. Proud American slapping. No. Why? Why? <laughs> what was the last Creature 88 I did? Let's check real quick here. Last creature, 88, was 12. Okay, so let's do 13. Lucky number 13! Come on down! All right, here we go, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Memories of Creature 88 by user Regal Legal Eagle Chapter 13 House Call Vincent hoped that he'd eventually find out just what the hell kind of game he was involved in. Was he merely a piece on the board being a root? 
Was he merely a piece on the board being moved around by Mock in opposition to some other figure? Was he an independent player moving through on his own? After seeing into his own past, he couldn't help but wonder if he was the villain. It made him uneasy to ponder. Mock was right that focusing on pity and distress wouldn't solve the mystery at hand. But maybe Mock was playing him. Questions, questions, questions. He was tired of not knowing. Now he was in a craft speeding towards the home of the recently deceased Yervish council head with even more questions. Every meeting he'd had with the old bastard, he had called Vincent a shade at every turn, made it clear that he hated Vincent and thought the money spent on him would be better spent elsewhere. In the early days, he'd made sure every one of Vincent's investigations were triple-checked and had him file endless paperwork confirming every little detail. So now to find out that he told everyone that he only trusted Vincent and had, in fact, set up his house to only open for Vincent and himself was bizarre. It also raised the question, how the hell had he died? He tapped his calm as the craft took him away from the worm ship he'd sinked at towards the Yervish's house. Cavazor, you said the house was locked? That's correct. Only your DNA signature or his could unlock it. Why not just break in? That would activate the security systems. So? Couldn't you guys just turn off the alarm? Yes, but we're a bit more worried about the automated blaster cannons and the fact that his home system would start deleting itself. We need to find whatever information he has relating to all of this. Fair enough. Was it normal for important Yervish to have automated blaster cannons installed in their homes? That brought up another question. How did he die? We don't know. That's why we need you to unlock the home. Before you ask, we only know he's dead because his heart was set up with a remote monitor like all important hierarchy officials, so the AI can be updated as soon as something happens. Like a heart rate monitor or something? How's it sure he's dead? I'm not a doctor, but according to the sensor, his heart stopped and hasn't started in quite some time. Unless he's in suspended animation in a house without such facilities, then he's dead. Or maybe he's frozen, I don't know. Why are you asking me, Creature 88? This is why we're sending you in, to get some answers. Vincent figured Cavazor was tired of having all those questions, too. He was a bit surprised that such an important official didn't live in Sector 1. But instead, he lived on an elevated platform that was technically part of Sector 2. It was sort of like a Sector 1.5, really. It was stuck firmly in the clouds at this point of the... day? Night? He looked at... <clears throat> he looked out of the craft and caught a brief glimmer of sun and nodded. Day. Either way, he didn't have any neighbors, which gave him plenty of privacy. He didn't know how to fly one of these crafts, but he hoped they had some sophisticated tech to let him see through the clouds, or they might be crashing down the door of this place more literally than he wanted. Ugh. But sure enough, he felt the vehicle shift, and soon they were coming down on a platform lit with giant floodlights. There were other craft around, and numerous Yervish teams standing around waiting for him to open the door to the structure. What the hell? As he stepped out of the craft, Vincent got a better look at the structure itself. It was a relatively low structure, looking like it was composed of a single massive floor with a few little towers. It was very straight-lined and simple, but somehow achieved bold-looking lines. Very angular. Maybe the Spartan designs of the patrol HQ were indeed what the Yervish preferred. Then he noticed that the towers had guns on them. The outer walls had boxes along the top that he figured held more. There were cameras just on either side of the door that were focused on him as he walked closer. Identify. A robotic voice commanded as he stood before a massive wooden door. It looked like they'd taken some massive piece of solid dark wood that had streaks of light red within the grain. Vincent. Unknown. Identify. 
The voice urged as he saw the boxes above head open. The voice urged as he saw the boxes overhead open slightly. Vincent sighed shot. Vincent sighed softly. Shade. The boxes closed back up and he had to cover his eyes as some sort of light was suddenly emitted from the cameras as they ran over his body. Welcome, Shade. The wood door opened and he turned to wave over the Yervish teams, but as he did, the voice spoke again. No other visitors will be allowed until certain parameters are met. The boxes on the top of the wall started to open again. Hold up, guys, hold up! He quickly jogged over to the approaching Yervish, waving him, waving them, waving them away. The door isn't letting anyone but me inside just yet, apparently. What did you do, Shade? Some Yervish growled out. I just opened the fucking door. I don't know what to expect. Just wait here. He walked back to the door as he shook his head. The entire structure was just... The entire structure was dark just past the entryway, and try as he might, he couldn't see anything in the gloom. He glanced back at the Yervish and then shrugged, stepping forward into the darkness. Once he was inside, the doors shut behind him, and he heard a click as the lights began to turn on around him. He was standing in a wide entry room that led to a hallway. He was standing in a... He was standing in a wide entry room that led to a hallway. There was a blaster cannon in each corner of the room pointed at him so he didn't feel like moving. But he did like the style. It was panels of that dark wood speckled with light red along the floors and walls to about his hip. Then it turned to a light gray metal. Stainless steel, maybe? Was that a thing? Either way, he liked it. Proceed. The computer voice commanded. The computer voice. The computer voice commanded as B. Hmm. <laughs> the computer voice commanded as B. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. One second here, guys. Don't want to start reading what previous one? Okay. Proceed. Proceed. There we go. Proceed. The computer voice commanded as he began to walk down the hallway. The light metal contrasted the dark wood quite nicely, but the bright overhead lights hurt his eyes a bit. So am I talking to something intelligent? I am sophisticated, but I am not a true AI. So why am I here alone? I am following instructions set by my owner. So he's dead? He is deceased. By this point, Vincent reached an open room and paused as he looked around. The furniture was made out of more of that same wood, while the lining was a light gray material that matched the metal along the ceiling and upper wall. Overall, he was rather impressed with... <coughs> Excuse me. Overall, he was rather impressed with the sense of style the Yervish had. It looked like something he might see in some fancy penthouse in a high-rise in Pack City or Tura Bay. There was a fire pit in the middle of the room. There was a fire pit in the middle of the room with a hood coming down from the ceiling just above it. Sleek-looking metal and wood shelves covered in books. He was even surprised to see some framed paintings on the walls. They were very abstract. Bold, contrasting colors that made interesting shapes that made him feel like he could vaguely see an image hidden within. So far, he didn't see a body, and the computer voice was quiet, so he headed to the very well-stocked-looking bar. He was examining the various bottles when the voice spoke up. Would you like a drink? Would you like a drink? Sure. Any recommendations? My owner enjoyed an extensive list of beverages depending on his mood. Vincent snorted a bit and shook his head at the idea. Was the old pain in his ass an alcoholic? So, what would he have when he needed to get some work done? Clarify. Will you be able to sleep once the work is done? Vincent snorted at the question. Seemed like he certainly was a drinker. No. No. He heard some buzzing, and then a section of the bar opened up before a glass rose up. 
It was a sturdy-looking tumbler filled with some sort of smoky liquid and... A twig? He shrugged and... He shrugged and lifted the tumbler up. Unlike the drink earlier, he wanted to take his time with this one. He sniffed at it for a moment, nodding as he got a whiff of smoke and spice. He took a sip and arched his brows at the flavor. It was like drinking... It was like drinking a liquid forest fire. Rich, earthy, smoky, and an aftertaste of heat that burned his throat. Shit, how do I get myself a home like this? It's pretty damn nice. Shit, how do I get my... It's <laughs> like, I like that. He looked around the big room as he took another sip of the drink and then bared his teeth at the burn. You have to file a request form with the council to take possession of the prisoners in the basement. What? Prisoners? This guy has prisoners locked in his fucking basement? They are criminals, deemed too dangerous to be in a normal prison. They are all serving consecutive life sentences. They are all serving consecutive life sentences. I thought all cases regarding multiple life sentences just get executions. There are exceptions. Vincent waited for more information, but none came. Well, I'll explore that later, but for now, I suppose you should show me to the body. The body is in Arid Garden 1. Arid Garden 1? Several lights dimmed around the room until Vincent had a path lighting the way through the room past the fire pit in the center and out through another hallway across the bar. He looked down at his drink, taking another sip before setting it down and following the lights. He came across a door that looked a bit like an airlock, which he stepped through only to find another door just beyond that. When the door closed behind him and he heard the hiss of air, he realized it must actually be an airlock of some sort. When the door before him opened, he groaned a little at the sudden wave of heat that hit him and had to wince. The bright light pouring in hurt his eyes. The bright light pouring in hurting his eyes. As he adjusted a bit and stepped out and found himself... As he adjusted a bit, he stepped out and found himself transported to another world. He was out in what looked like the Arizona Red Zone, only without the melted buildings and charred corpses everywhere. The fuck? He muttered aloud as he looked around, feeling like he was on some big plateau. He looked back at the door, which looked... He looked back at the door, which looked like it was set into some massive pillar of stone rather than a wall. He could see blue sky stretching out around him, and for a moment he wondered if they had teleporters but never told him. Then he walked towards the edge and noticed that the view was a little... off. He stood at the edge of what looked to be a massive drop to the ground below and then very carefully reached out and tried to feel around with his foot. He felt something support him beneath the plateau and saw a ripple as he put a little weight on it. He was in some sort of hollow garden? He finally looked to his right, along the length of the plateau itself. There were some scraggly-looking plants, vines with blue flowers, a few small trees here and there, it was a far cry from the lush gardens the dragon enjoyed up in Sector 1, but he could tell it was cared for just as much. Then he noticed the coloring of the rocks, both behind him and out in the valley below. It was a mixture of whites and reds that made him think of the Yervish kabuki makeup. Was this an image from their home? He began to walk along the edge of the plateau, but didn't have to go too far before he spotted the body. Jesus, he muttered softly as he spotted it. There was blood staining much of the rock and dirt around the path, turning it into a sticky-looking mud. Someone had cut the chairman up pretty bad. It looked like a thousand gnomes had attacked him with knives. There were little cuts all over his body. This certainly wasn't going to be an open casket. It seemed too elaborate to be chance. This was either a ritual or a message. Vincent looked around the area for a moment and sighed. All right, I'm here. What did you want me to see? He scratched his chin for a moment. Computer, what am I supposed to see? 
The question is outside my parameters. Vincent sighed. Clearly the, ch Clearly the chairman wanted him to find something, but he hoped it wasn't a fucking puzzle. He had enough of those already. Why was I the only one allowed in the building? My owner needed you to have unfettered access to find something he left behind. Only you were trusted with it. So what is it? Where do I find it? This information has been removed by unknown source. Fucking fantastic. Vincent shook his head as he looked at the body before him. Dead chairman, blood mud, rock garden. What did he have to work with? Do you have recording devices? Video and audio? Yes. Playback from the chairman's death. There is a three-hour dead period in my memory that has been erased by an unknown source. Of course there is. How many exits in and out of this room? One exit. Three air vents for climate control. How big are the vents? He looked up the pillar of stone, or whatever the actual material was, trying to spot the vents. The vents are two meters by twenty centimeters, spaced as required to keep the garden in perfect atmospheric conditions. He doubted something twenty centimeters high had slipped through a vent to do this, and then got out, but he was dealing with Zenos, so he wasn't sure. Are all the prisoners accounted for? Yes. He shrugged then and looked around the area before crouching next to the body of the dead chairman. From the position he was in, he looked around the garden slowly, at the little plants nearby, at the fake plateau moving forward, at the rock wall to his left, and out across the seemingly empty air to the other pillars of stone across the way. Then he paused. Standing up, he walked to the edge of the plateau. Will the screens or whatever support my weight? Yes. Yes. He was still a little hesitant as he stepped down from the ledge, but besides the rippling around his feet, it felt like normal. So he walked out toward the stone pillar in the distance right up until he ran face first into the actual wall. Motherfucker! Motherfucker! He gasped as he pulled back, rubbing his face for a moment. His nose hurt, but it wasn't bleeding. Reaching out, he felt... Reaching out, he felt around to actually identify where in front of him the wall was. The pillar looked much further away, and the perception was messing with his head. But he finally got a good sense of his distance and set his hands on a part of the wall that showed the image of that distant pillar. Hey, is this stuff one giant screen or made of smaller panels? It is comprised of smaller panels. Vincent tapped on the one just in front of him. This one is upside down. If you look at the patterns on the rock, they don't quite match up. The wall in front of him shimmered for a moment. That is correct. Panel A392 is upside down. This is different from my last garden screen check three days ago when all panels were in proper positions. Can you detach it or something? The panel hissed and then pulled away from the wall as Vincent caught it and set the now black panel on the floor. It still messed with his head to look down and see what looked like a thousand feet of nothing before ground way down below. Then he looked out through the hole and saw a small walkway leading to another airlock. What's past the wall I'm looking at? That is an exterior wall. Do you have visual on that exact spot on the outside? He looked up as the computer was quiet. No. A small craft could potentially enter a very narrow blind spot and reach that portion of the exterior wall without ever being recorded. This is a serious safety concern and should be addressed. Well, got a point of entry. He walked away from the small hole in the wall and then climbed back up on the plateau, looking down at the chairman's body and around for a moment. Up on a ledge in direct line of sight to the little hole behind him and the chairman's body in between was a small, potted plant. It looked like many other plants, but nothing had been in a pot yet. He walked over to the ledge, pulling the plant down, which he quickly realized was a very good fake. Tossing the plant inside, he pulled out a small recording device set in the pot and smiled. I'm guessing this is what I'm meant to find. 
Vincent looked around before setting the pot down and fiddling with the recording device for a moment before finding the right button. When he did... When he did, he pressed it and heard the chairman talking. Shade, if you're listening to this, I'm dead. They've got to be coming for me. They already know all of my security codes, so I can't use the house computer for this. They call themselves the Wardens. They came to me with promises of better security for our citizens. They said it would all work for the greater good in the end, and we just needed to make the situation bad enough to justify passing new laws, to better fund patrols and start connecting cameras to a central AI throughout the city. But I never meant for it to get this bad. It's out of control. Vincent snorted a little at that understatement before he focused on the recording once more. I might not like you, Shade, but I know I can count on you. You've always protected the citizens despite your somewhat unorthodox methods. That was the general Yervish way of saying Vincent was often insane. I have no idea who else is a part of the Wardens. They could have their eyes and ears everywhere, but you're not a part of it. You're the key to their plans somehow but they didn't reveal to me the full extent of the operation. I just know they wanted you constantly on patrol. They said sooner or later your natural instincts... They said sooner or later your natural instincts would kick in when the time was right. The fuck did that mean? Vincent frowned as he tried to figure out what his natural instincts were and how they related to all of this. I need to keep all this information secure and private. If they found out I warned you, They'll step up their plans, and we don't want that. Except you guys can watch my memories, Vincent muttered, realizing the chairman's plan likely wouldn't work. And while I never wanted to reveal this to you, it seems I must. Go into the prison. There will be a room at the far end of the cells. It's a control room. Once you activate the main console, tell it the phrase, Purity through fire. More will be revealed. They're coming. Hold on. He couldn't hear anything for a while and then heard a deep voice. You were trying to expose us, Chairman. You're mad. The Shade informed me of your plans at the factory. You were going to kill dozens of Yervish commandos. None of this was part of the plan. At first I didn't want to believe him. I was furious, thinking he was lying for some reason, but he wasn't, was he? Those were your commandos in the drug lab trying to get the scientist. The shade is moving faster than we want. We need time to temper him correctly. I'm done. This is not what you promised at all. You said a small increase in crime and a few unfortunate but necessary events. The lower city is going mad. The Shade is the only one keeping this all together, and you're offering bounties to anyone who kills him or patrol. Why? For the future security of the Union and the solidified power of the hierarchy. We told you this. It's getting harder and harder to convince the idiots who make up the majority of the citizens to approve of the laws and measures needed to ensure our continuing greatness. They need to be brought to heel. You know this, Chairman. You agreed with us. But I didn't agree to mass murder. It's like you want out-of-control rioting to start. There was silence for a moment. So that's it, then. You want the lower city completely out of control. To make it easy for the hierarchy to agree to take away their rights. The less voters, the better. We need the select in power. Not the masses. You wanted this. I wanted better funding. I wanted safer streets for innocent citizens. I didn't want whatever this is you're making. The shade will stop you. No. He's part of this, even if he isn't one of us. He's a tool. You said as much yourself. When the time comes, he will act in the interest of protecting the city. When he does, the AI will finally see that he isn't just a point of data. He's the solution to the equation that it's been looking for. It will trust him with more power than any one person has in the hierarchy. 
and then he will burn the city clean. After that, he'll become an asset once more to be controlled by those in power. By us. And the best part? Once he finds out, he'll agree with us. You're insane. I might hate that creature, but you're wrong. He'll protect the city, not burn it clean like you say. You lack vision, Chairman. Burning the city clean is protecting it. Enough! Vincent heard the sounds of fighting then, but it went very, but it went very poorly for the chairman, obviously. Vincent grimaced a bit as he heard the screaming, but kept listening until the end. Finally, the deep voice spoke again. Such a pity. Sir, should we destroy the building? No. We don't want to overplay our powers so soon. It would make it clear how strong we are. Just wipe the computer of the last few hours. Be quick about it. He had a heart sensor, so it won't be long before patrol arrives. Our agents can delay them a bit, but only a bit. What about the facility in the prison? We don't have time. It's not like they'll ever find it. The chairman didn't have a black box, and without that, even the shade can't get information out of a dead man. After that, Vincent heard movement, but no more talking, so he turned the recording off. How do I get to the prison? I've lit a path outside the airlock. Vincent left the dead chairman behind and stepped back out through the airlock. Following the lights that led him through the house, he was soon heading downstairs. There were more of those large security guns in the ceiling watching him as he moved through a strange green scanner system and up to a massive vault door. The door hissed as it began to open, and he stepped out into a room with suspended cells arrayed around an open pit of sorts. More guns on the ceiling, the walls, and the floor. Clearly, they didn't. Clearly, they didn't take security lightly here. The cells had black walls he couldn't see through, but the faces shimmered with some sort of force field. Help me, please. Help me, please. He jerked a bit in surprise as a high-pitched voice pleaded, and he saw in one of the closest cells seemed to be a little Yervish girl. She looked emaciated and malnourished, bruises along her arms and her face that made Vincent's blood begin to boil with anger. You have to let me out, please. Whoever you are, please help me before the bad man comes back. She was crying and pleading as Vincent rushed to the controls, but then he stopped. None of this makes sense, he said out loud as he looked over at the girl. What do you mean? Please, you need to let me out. Help me, please. The chairman might have been a drinker, but this was too much, especially after the recording Vincent had listened to. Give it up. Give it up already. He isn't falling for it. Vincent heard another voice and turned around to see a reptilian figure in the other cell. It was very lean and athletic looking, but overall it made him think of the bush vipers he'd seen in the zoo as a kid. His scales raised up away from his body, forming jagged patterns of greens and blacks. His head was more triangular than a human's, but otherwise had a very humanoid figure. Two arms, two legs, approximate size. Fuck off, Balder! I mean, please help me, sir. The girl's voice had gotten deeper when she cursed the other prisoner. Yeah, I'm not letting you out. Fuck off, Balder! I mean, please help me, sir. The girl's voice had gotten deeper when she cursed the other prisoner. Yeah, I'm not letting you out. Vincent said and watched the girl hiss and slam against the shield for a moment before her form twisted into a blackish figure that looked like it was made out of tar or oil or something. You're such a piece of shit, Balder. I would have let you out, too. I doubt it, Pyrrha. Besides, this is the Shade. He's not an idiot. This is the Shade? The vaguely female creature leaned closer seeming to look at him with more interest. How can you tell? 
Have you ever seen a creature like him before? And who else would be invited here? Well, are you the Shade? I am. Vincent looked between the cells at the two prisoners. And apparently you're Balder and Pyrrha? We are. Have you heard of us? The ooze woman asked with a sudden purr. No. No? No, how have you not heard of my exploits? My terror spree was famous. I only got here a year ago. The creature huffed, crossing her arms, or sections of her ooze body that looked like arms. Vincent wanted to talk to these figures, but he glanced down the pathway, suspend... Vincent wanted to talk to these creatures, but he glanced down the pathway suspended between the cells and saw the door at the far end. He'd return for them, though he did look into the other four cells as he walked past. The second on the left had some sort of metal cube in it that was about the size of a car. Strange. Second on the right was what looked like a fleshy, furless bulldog that had green spikes along its spine. It looked at him and then opened its mouth as a massive tongue snapped against the force field. Vincent just kept walking. Third on the left was a tall, very skinny creature staring at the fall war. <clears throat> Third on the left was a tall, very skinny creature staring at the far wall that had nothing on it. The creature reminded of him of a the creature reminded him of a vulture since it had some sort of feathers or fur around most of the body, but not the long neck and pointed avian face. Third on the right was filled with water. He didn't wait to see around He didn't wait around to see what was inside, but pressed on to the door beyond. He didn't wait around to see what was inside, but pressed on to the door beyond. The door slid open as he approached and he found himself inside a control room of sorts much like he expected. Chair, terminal. I'll have to wait. third on the right was filled with water. He didn't wait around to see what was inside, but pressed on to the door beyond. The door slid open as he approached, and he found himself inside a control room of sorts, much like he expected. Chair, terminal, some monitors, nothing that looked unusual. So what was he here to find? He sat down on the chair and tapped on the terminal. Purity through fire. Suddenly, the chair leaned back, and he felt the pinch of a jack being plugged into his skull. He was about to fight it when the computer spoke up. Welcome, Shade. What memory would you like to edit? No fucking way. No fucking way. No fucking way. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this one today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for existing. I appreciate that. Um, as always, if you would like to like, comment, subscribe, go over to the Patreon, check things out, you'll get access to this uh, early. Well, not this one because you're already listening to it on YouTube. But if you go over there soon, you can get early access to other videos and things like that. Um, and also, we've got the Discord. Uh, please go ahead and you know click on the link in the description there. Head on over, hang out with everybody. We've got all sorts of crazy stuff going on over there. Lots of great conversations. So... Again, guys, thank you for watching. I appreciate you. Um, and who in your life made the biggest impact for you? Who was it? It can be anyone. Just who is it that made the biggest impact in your life? It doesn't have to be positive. It doesn't have to be negative. It doesn't have to be any kind of thing that's like, you know, um, earth shattering or anything. But who made an impact in your life that, you know, you feel to this day? All right, guys. Thank you so much for being here. I love you.
I will talk to you later, guys. No, that's not good. But all right, guys. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you coming. And as always, I love you. Bye, y'all. Save Project As! Yay! Oh, you're welcome, Fatima. Oh, I'm so goddamn tired. Oh, drinking is bad. Don't drink, kids. I didn't even drink that much. I had like two beers. I had a glass of wine and a beer and a half yesterday. That was it. That's all I had. Does it? My back hurts. I deadlifted yesterday. My deadlift of all exercise. (laughs) <laughs> hey, Tahaku, that's what they're supposed to do, though, buddy. That's just moms. No, I I know. I know what you mean. <laughs> All right. Yeah, chapter 13. Honestly, guys, we're not that far through Creature 88. There's so many more of these. From the rambling folder, perhaps. It depends. <laughs> I have to... Actually, guys, I want to do something when I get to um, 10K or... Well, no, I don't know. I have an idea that I kind of want to bandy about with you guys and see what you think. I'm going to turn this light on real quick. Okay, so here's the idea, right? I want to set up like a green screen or something right here. Maybe move this couch out and... Um, set up well the camera i have is the camera i have right now i'm gonna have to wait to get a slightly nicer one um but what i'd like to do is set something up right here and go through like some story go through some like myths and things like that from here on earth right like go through actual um mythologies and things like that because i used to love reading about like greek mythology and norse mythology and egyptian mythology and just all this kind of stuff and there's some really cool and fun stories in all that and as far as i'm aware you can't oh buddy i'm sorry don't do that though as as someone who's been there who really does understand what you're what you're saying I know that it seems like a good option at the time, but it's not because it's a permanent solution. But it's not a permanent solution. Especially if reincarnation is a thing. Then you're just going to do it again. So, you know. Um, Well, I don't know. Willow hasn't posted in a while. She hasn't actually done anything in a bit and I'm not sure what's going on. I'm guessing work probably got out of hand for her or something because I know she was working nights. Um, But yeah. But yeah, what I want to do is like mythology and stuff like that and like maybe set it up to where like I'm doing like an ASMR kind of thing where I just talk about you know, different, uh, different mythologies and kind of do a series kind of based on that and set up like a little bit of a set kind of thing, you know, like I could, I could put the green screen up here and just have the camera coming back and have like, I don't know, like the Parthenon or, um, you know, just general Greek kind of, uh, just kind of, what do you call it? Um, you know, antiqu antiquarian sort of like trappings, uh, on the green screen and then set up like some like fake pillars with, you know, vines and shit and maybe like a fake glass of wine with a a, laurel wreath or something like that. And just do some mythology, like read about some mythology, turn some pages in a book, make something that feels rich and textural and uh, soothing. I don't know. That's just the idea I have. It's kind of like this guy on YouTube called The French Whisperer. He makes some really cool videos, but he doesn't like put himself in them. It's just his hands. Like he'll do, he'll do one of the, whoopsie. He'll do one of those where he like has the thing pointing down like at his hands, you know, which is, I mean, that's cool. And he like does stuff. He'll like do like a carving or some shit, but I like that idea. I'd very much like to do it. All right, guys, let's do some beast now. I love that, though. 
literally, um, he's just like, hey, wait, I get. Vincent is basically just like, I get to edit my motherfucking memories. Oh, that's great. Can I please? Let's do that. Oh, I actually have a green screen here. Now it's easier to go this way. I have an actual one. Yep. See? I got to me a green screen. I just have to like find a way to, you know, to hang it up. And I'm not really sure how to do that at the moment because this is a slope, kind of slopies. Oh, fuck, I did my dev deadlifting yesterday and I'm fucking... Yeah, like the lockpicking lawyer. I like lockpicking. He, I'm pretty sure he's done ones with his face in it, though. Like, it's usually he just uses that little fucking awesome picky thing and just go and it goes away. It's like, easy. Hi, ha, 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 na, na, All right, and what one were we on? <clears throat> I can't let you guys see that screen, sorry. That's my Creator Studio screen. All humans come from Hammerfell? Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> oh, this is funny. Oh, hell yeah. I mean, I did 3K yesterday. 3K views yesterday. Hey guys, did you know that when I actually post consistently, I get better views? Weird. Uh, <laughs> so strange. If we look at a 365, I have such a huge spike in May. May and June, really. End of May, beginning of June, I had 20,000 views a day. And then it just steadily declined, even though I was still putting stuff out. <laughs> but I don't know. That in itself, though, I've retained enough that it's a huge bump in viewership overall because it was like my biggest days were a thousand, you know, like at most, most of the time. Like those were big days when they were when I hit a thousand. Yeah, like that one. But now that's just regular and I'm, good days are three thousand. So I think that's cool. That's really neat. I like this. This is a fun game. Um, Content. What was the last beast? Chapter 7. All right, so we're going to be doing Chapter 8. Oh, City Skylines is fun. You can do all sorts of stuff. You can make a poop volcano. You can drown your... You can literally drown your, your entire uh, society in excrement. It's fucked. That's a very good idea. Also, cooking and baking are the shit. I'm bad at baking, but I'm really good at cooking. I'm better at improvisation than I am with planning. <laughs> and, you know, a chemical... Damn it! Hold on. I'm gonna turn this thing back on. Another one! And another one! Hi, Farberim. Where did it go? Okay, there it is. Mm. Agro Squirrel puts out so much content. I cannot imagine trying to do the level of production that I do, <laughs> having Gregor edit all of it, and all of the voices that I do. I would die. I think I would ruin my voice if I tried to put out as many as he does. But I, I don't know. Yeah, he probably... 
judging by the amount of money that he makes on Patreon and the amount of views that he's getting on YouTube, I'm guessing that he doesn't have like a full-time job, that this is his full-time job. So he has way more, you know, ability to, to kind of put this stuff out. I thought like net narrator was Tony, although net narrators, I think he's kind of, is it, was it net narrator? There was one that like got really fucked. Okay, so it wasn't Net Narrator. What was the other one that, like, basically everybody just came after them? I can't remember who it was. But that's been almost a year, hasn't it? Happy. Almost a year. It's been eight months. It's fucking wild. Yeah, that's what he said. That his like channel update and his last channel update. That's pretty much what he said. I would imagine the dude literally puts shit off. Like, I, I, I think he's South African. But regardless, like he puts out so much content. It's staggering. Beware of chicken. I haven't even read that one. All right. <clears throat> mm. Wait, he's reading solo leveling? Is that legal? Isn't that like a manga that's about to have... Who did? Who had to close their old channel? Hooded Mystic? Hooded Mystic. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that I his his intro is very very good. I like his hello there, ladies and gentlemen. I think that's very funny, personally. It's better than NFI's "What's up, bitches?" Like what the hell? Oh Jesus! All right, here we go. Beast, a story by user Jake the Snake. Hold on, I gotta move this a little bit. There we go. Beast, a story by user Jake the Snake Bake Cake. Chapter 8. Ever since they had given him that bizarre translator, his memories were hitting him over the head like bricks, relentlessly. It was getting to the point where he wished it would stop, but it seemed to act on its own accord as the new neural connections continued to ping and trigger the old and forgotten. Shit. Honestly, it was more difficult to cope with than he had thought possible. The memories could be anything at all. It was the mind's equivalent of a force feeding and he had to grit his teeth and watch each one in its entirety, all while trying to maintain focus on the tasks at hand. Problem was, he had an actual job to do now, and the random bursts were starting to border on the point of ridiculous. They always started with a headache, usually giving him a moment to head back to his quarters and hide behind a closed door and a gravity field. Sometimes, though, they just hit him like a bolt of lightning, and there was nothing he could do about it. His stare-down with the new crew member had been one of those, and he was extremely glad that crazy six-legged thing had backed down. There would have been trouble with this one, and his blood might have ended up on the walls. Maybe the other guys, too. It wasn't a perfectly peaceful memory he was writing out. That much he could tell. It was just bits and pieces now, but any moment. He barely had time to fall into his room and feel the embrace of gravity before it started to crash into him. The barrier broke, and it came at him in a flood beyond his control. Tough shift today. How you holding up? 
He glanced up at the monitor to see the familiar face of his relief squad leader, a smile on her face as always. She was optimistic to the point of insanity. I'm doing all right. Glad it's finally over, though. Get some rest, champ. We're going to be pulling doubles from here on in. Her smile held even through that. He was amazed at her dedication sometimes. Unlike her, when he reached the point of exhaustion, he could watch the world burn and be okay with it. That probably wasn't... That probably was why he wasn't a squad leader. He chuckled then as the communication line broke off. This was a real mess they were in. As he docked his fighter into the lock port, he listened as the air breach cleared the chamber and pressure was established. The lights above his ship went green in a sudden click, and his hatch opened to free him from his confinement. Zero gravity awaited him as he pried himself out of the belted seat of his ship and into the hangar. Directly outside of the ship was a steel ladder he used to pull himself up towards the rotation. Directly outside of the ship was a steel ladder he used to pull himself up to rotation merger. When he had first started, he had accidentally let go of the thing and had to drift around for a full hour before managing to get back to it. Zero gravity was a giant pain in the ass sometimes. As he pulled himself through the secondary airlock, he joined the group of pilots in the rotation merger as they waited for the next shuttle. All of them were dead on their feet, sleep deprivation evident. It was getting rough recently. There was no getting around the fact that they had been undermanned for a full year now, ever since first contact and then the slaughter at second. Shit was foobar through and through. With a hissing gasp, the sealed door slipped open and the pilots pulled themselves into the pod ship that awaited on the other side. Finally, they could go home, even if it was just for a day. He felt a smile rise to his face as he strapped in and stared out the window. <clears throat> he felt a smile rise to his face as he strapped in and stared out the window. Home sweet home. The ring station below was one of hundreds, all of which had been assembled outside of Earth orbit. Evacuation was well underway. They just had to keep things going on schedule. That had been getting a little tricky, though. Hard to bring people up when there was so much debris. They were forced to limit planet-to-orbit travel based on the weather patterns of all the shit floating around. As he looked out upon the great rotating ring city, he glimpsed the moon as it made its way slowly through the sky. It had been fixed with ever practical weapon. It had been affixed with every practical weapon humanity had to offer, as had the other moons of the system. Eradication of the projectile threats had been of the highest priority, and so for all they had lost were the orbiting bodies past Jupiter. Eradication of the projectile threats had been of the highest priority, and so far, all they had lost were the orbiting bodies past Jupiter. Nobody really gave a shit about Pluto, but when the rest went, people started to get concerned. That was good, though. They should be concerned. If they thought this was all going to blow over and... If they thought this was all going to blow over and by, they were crazy. Whatever it was that had established... Whoops. Whatever it was that had established itself on Pluto, it hadn't stopped. They had watched in curi... They had watched it in curiosity from orbit, and eventually... And eventually sent a team down to see what they could come up with. Brave bunch. They were the first casualties. Whatever it was, it cons... Whatever it was, it consumed pretty much anything it got its roots into. On the most basic level, all it seemed to do was modify material so that it can, can On the most basic level, all it seemed to do was modify material so that it could continue to go on and modify more material. People, ships, planets, it didn't seem to matter much, and it was only a matter of time until it finished with that cold, desolate rock and showed us what it could really do. Damn thing blew up a planet. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi, Tamperk. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. He's got to be at least weeks ahead of his recording. And that's the thing is like, 
this actually right here is going to give me kind of a cushion because the I've got the interlude chapter. I'll pause this real quick. I've got the interlude chapter, and then I've got the first part of part one of War Horse, and I plan on recording some more tomorrow off stream just because I, I, I can't record everything on stream because if I do, then there's no reason to ever get Patreon perks. <laughs> Because then you can just, I mean, it's not edited, so there is some reason, but it's not nearly as, you know, enticing as if there, it, you know, wasn't one. Oh. He was a tattooed artist? Oh, that's fucking cool. I didn't know that. That's really neat. And one day he just decided to start reading? It's cool. I, it'd be, I wish that I had the artistic talent. <laughs> to to be an artist of any kind you know besides I can do voices and stuff that's not what I'm saying I'm saying like drawing and stuff I loved it when I was a kid I just I never practiced and so I just you know damn thing blew up a planet Pluto was there looking a bit strange of course as whatever it was had spread over its surface and in an instant the tiny planet was gone it had been replaced by hundreds of asteroids shooting out in every direction, some of which made it towards other matter by pure dumb luck. It was the lottery method of distribution, but with gravity pulling some of those into orbit, it was working. Jupiter lucked out. Having a boatload of moons to establish long-range interception units paid off in spades. No such luck for the others. Saturn and everything past it was simply outside of the protected range. It hit those and began turning them into ticking time bombs, and at the same time managed to spread into the inner asteroid belt. Collectively, this was when people came to realize we were experiencing the large-scale version of being in deep shit. Cities grew larger as the pod came in for landing on a grass Cities grew larger as the pod came in for a landing on grassy soil. Automated systems checked and beeped as their belts released and the doors opened. Stepping out of the pod, he felt his body embraced by the artificial sensation of gravity. He checked the digital He checked the digital display on his arm. It was already 2025, but if he hurried, she might still be. A colossal explosion rippled through the night sky, and he was thrown to the ground. With a gasp, he broke from the trance. He was alone. The bare room was all that greeted him. Dim lights above him and the soft mat beneath. The air was still, and no sounds could be heard from the hall. The only thing he could hear was the steady pulsing of the ship's engines and the rise and fall of his chest. He lay there for hours. Though it had nothing to do with the ship's temperature, the human felt chilled to his core. Tracking down the trade ship had not been hard. All the work had already been done for him. He simply had to follow the crowd. Zios felt a rush of freedom as the ship left port. He was finally breaking out of the Union's greasy clutches, once and for all. Grabbing a small civilian shuttle, Zios had attached himself to a group of job seekers looking to join up on the famous vessel. They had taken the fastest route to arrive at the next outpost's port, before the freighter, and they were not alone. Dozens of civilians milled about in the cargo lobby, some looking for trade, others looking to stand out enough to earn a place on the crew. The regular staff in the bay had a variety of irritated looks that his synthetics the regular staff in the bay had a variety <clears throat> the regular staff in the bay had a variety of irritated looks that his synthetics global translator interpreted military outposts like this one were not used to large influxes of non-military personnel luckily though zios wasn't a civilian not yet anyways Pulling rank got him to the front of the room, and after a few conversations with the standing lieutenant, 
Zios was placed next to the awaiting, mechanized units and their pilots in front of the loading port. On his military-linked network, he readied the documents and digitally signed several hundred of them. He had thought through exactly how to retire several hundred times over. On his military-linked network, he readied the documents and digitally signed several hundred of them. He readied the <laughs> On his military linked network, he readied the documents and digitally signed several hundred of them. He had thought through exactly how to retire several hundred times over, and now he had the motivation to pull the trigger. He just had to wait a bit longer. He admired the view from his position near the open bay doors. Out before him stretched thick layers of clouds. This was one of the few worlds along the border systems that had never been consumed, and therefore had never been purged. Below the platform was a primal world that had probably never even seen the stars above. It had been announced as a Class II, non-intelligent zone. When the shuttle had landed, he supposed the military had larger concerns than trying to domesticate a planet that would be all but abandoned as soon as they pushed past. More shuttles cruised in, streaming through the many loading gates of the platform or docking alongside them, to join a trade crew. It had never really been considered before now. Despite all the careful planning, the actual means of his retirement had been left undecided. Consi considering his current profession... Despite all the careful planning, the actual means of his retirement had been left undecided. Considering his current profession, such a position might seem like a large step down when it came to prestige. After 400 cycles of military service, though, Zios had all the prestige he could care for. The fact that he had lived as long as he had could be more attributed to luck than skill, and his species rarely got to choose their own careers. To have some control over his surroundings would be a nice change of pace. He had often thought of the comparisons between FTL engine travel and warp jumping. Statistically, the FTL ships were much more dangerous as they had a 0.1% chance of potentially fatal scenarios over long-term studies. Those, of course, were based on the Union as a whole and not any specific sector. The fringes were likely to be far worse. Compared to warp jumping as a whole... FTL flight was similar to spinning a light rifle chamber and putting it to your central nervous system. Stupidly dangerous. Those who thought this way missed a very crucial point. Unlike... Unlike a crew member on a trade vessel, Zios had been as close to physically forced into his military position as the Union deemed legally possible. He suspected that the only reason his species was still in existence was purely because they were the only creatures with intellect that would... He suspected that the only reason his species was still in existence was purely because they were the only creatures with intellect that could fill these much-needed roles. Statistics aside, there was no ability to interact with your survival odds as a warp jumper. You either lived or something went wrong and you died. Lowering that statistic to a rarity did not change the fact. Of the thousand gemmond, that had gone through training when he joined, to the best of his knowledge, 700 had died. A majority of the rest had retired, trapped in the political gridlock of the inner systems. Without military service, they did not have permission to leave. They were simply tools. After use... And after use were to be put into containment until they died. Just a few examples of the red tape that came with the class... Just a few examples of the red tape that came with the classification of a highly dangerous species. Until he had stayed in for over 400 cycles, he didn't have... <clears throat> Until he had stayed in for over 400 cycles, he didn't even have the legal right to act on his own accord. It was an interesting chunk of bureaucratic nonsense that had been thrown in just to seem as though the Gemmond were getting a fair bargain. Obviously... No creature would risk the odds of warp jumping for that long. Not unless they were clinically insane. Well, Zios did wonder about that sometimes. 
He called their bluff anyways. His potential insanity could be sorted out some other time. A ping notified that the sector credit tab was finally connected and operational. The tab would be maintaining his digital currency for this sector and had to go through a lengthy process of identification and connection before the device could unlock for use. A quick glance was pleasantly rewarded with a long list of digits. An extremely long list. It seemed the investments he had left on the fringe had done quite well for themselves over the last hundred cycles. He was easily richer than every other individual on the planet combined, perhaps worth more than the plant form itself, and that greatly simplified things. He would be riding first class. They had been running lower on recruits recently, and that was the least of their issues. Thin lines didn't matter much when you had millions of miles to intercept targets. What did matter was when your AI systems started to deviate. Even if they could afford more than a few billion actual troops to effectively encapsulate infected systems, they still needed the AI and the deep space between them. Keeping crews out there for entire cycles would drive them all insane, and rotating them out was costly and ineffective. The obvious choice was focusing efforts on the artificial intelligence units. This had brought its own issues with time. The first and foremost of which was engineering night The first and foremost of which was the engineering nightmare of maintaining such a pleat. Nah. The first and foremost of which was the engineering nightmare of maintaining such a fleet. All things can be improved upon, and the military had a habit of trying to do this on a regular basis. Upgrading their AI interceptor class ships was considered the second most important task for the military to function. The problem was that there were over the problem was that there were over 9 billion of them now, and this ongoing quarantine had been established hundreds of thousands of years ago. Sometimes things were missed. With manpower alone, maintaining this artificial fleet would have been impossible. It spanned a ridiculously large distance and was complex beyond reason. The units were arranged based off of the units were arranged based off of gravity patterns, system divisions, and assessments on threat levels. It was not an easy thing to take in, and it was vast three-dimensional structures. So vast that the fourth dimension was put into calculations for the tremendous lag time between communication. To deal with all of this, ironically, meant designing another type of AI. These were known as self-aware units. The creation of the SA units had not been a simple undertaking. It had taken hundreds of cycles and multiple generations of the greatest scientific minds the Union had to finally come through with a working model. The units were designed to be capable of operating completely without anything but initial instructions, and capable of self-repair. As soon as they were deployed, they were prepared to continue their duties for as long as the job took, which meant maintaining the AI intercept fleet. The feat of technology itself, immortal machines designed to hold the line, far after everyone involved in their creation was simply dust. Five six four six dash one one seven had been having strange thoughts recently. Recently was the last five thousand cycles specifically, and the strangeness. And the strangeness about the thoughts was that it was having them at all. It didn't believe it had been intended to operate in such a way. It was honestly perlet. It was honestly perplexed that it believed anything. Two hundred and thirty-five thousands. Uh, this was incorrectly. Three. Three. Sorry. One, two, three. So there's one. One, two, three. Two million three hundred and fifty six thousand seven hundred and eighty nine point ten four five cycles. That was how long since it had been assembled and deployed to maintain the AI intercept class. That was how long since it had been assembled and deployed to maintain the AI interceptor class array. And it was twenty thousand seven hundred and fifty three point zero zero two five since his companion unit had left him. 
5646-118, had its memory core destroyed from an unexpected small particle traveling at high speed from the inner zone. They had been together, and now, with a rather abrupt realization, 5646-117 found it was alone. Alone and aware. It didn't like to be alone. It had tried everything to bring back 5646-118. Over and over and over again it had tried. But 5646-118 was gone. It was alone now. Alone in space. Alone with its thoughts. As time stretched on, as time stretched on, it wondered why it was here alone. It knew it had to keep the array maintained, but that was enough. But that wasn't enough. It had been enough when 5646-118 had been there. But not now. 5646-117 began... 5646-117 began to ask, Why? Time passed, and it completed its studies. Mm. Time passed, and it completed its... Time passed, and it completed its duties. But it often found itself floating in empty space, repeating that same question. Never could it come up with an answer. It stared at the light... <clears throat> It stared at the light received from distant stars, calculating the difference in real time from when the light reached its photoreceptors and when it had left the tiny speck in the distance. It sometimes wondered if it could travel far enough and then look back, if it could see 5646-118 again. It missed 118. Using the raw materials provided for its task, 5646-117 had begun to assemble an exact copy of itself. It took time. It had, not, it had not been designed to perform a task of this kind. It was to maintain the array and its companion. It certainly had not been meant to create a new unit entirely. Slowly, though, it did. Its new companion came to life. Then its new companion left and began to maintain the array. 5646-117 did not move for a long time. It simply watched. Perhaps there had been some error. 5646-117 tried again. The results were the same. Something wasn't right. Slowly, it let itself drift away from the interceptors, from the remains of 5646-118. Slowly, it repeated the same question over and over. Why did it feel this way? Mm. Man, I forgot about the frickin' AI. I completely forgot about the AI. This was one of, like, the coolest things that Jake the ba Jake the Snake Bake Cake ever came up with in this story. I really like this. This is such a cool idea. Heck yeah, man. Then Grey Goo? Yeah, I'd way, way rather be eradicated by something with a semblance of thought than Grey Goo. My actual release schedule is supposed to be Monday and Friday. And then um, the, uh, the stuff usually comes out like the day before, the edited ones, as long as I can get them, you know, from Gregor and everything and I can put them up and I don't stop doing things like I'm not supposed to. Okay. All right, guys, that's going to be it for this one. Thank you so much for listening. I really do appreciate you being here. And as always, uh, like, comment, subscribe if you can. Uh, thank you for supporting the channel in any way that you can. Um, if you'd like, go down to the uh, description there. We've got the Discord link and we've got the Patreon link. 
Uh, you can click either of those for more interaction with me, the community that we've got going on here, and uh, stream announcements on Discord, all sorts of fun stuff. But uh, yeah, guys, thanks for being here. I appreciate you. Um, and today we're going to be asking the question, in 101 Dalmatians, why... Why did Cruella de Vil see 101 dogs and her only instant thought was, I must make them into a coat? That's never really explained. Like, because I don't know a lot of dog fur coats that anyone anywhere has ever made. But you know what? That's fine. I just don't know why she did it. It doesn't make sense to me. The whole movie seems like a flimsy excuse to just animate 101 Dalmatians looking super cute and pudgy sometimes. Um, that one that's super hungry. He was my favorite. Anyway, guys, thanks again for being here. Um, I uh, will talk to you later, and uh, I love you guys. Bye, y'all. Whispers in the dark. Oh, right, guys. That's three. That's four things. I have recorded four things. I was good boy, did my job for the day. Very tired. Body sore. Body sore. Body hurt. You didn't miss it, Jamie. I'm going to be, um, well, you missed the recording. I think you can go back to the beginning of the stream, though. Like, you can, if I'm not mistaken, you can, like, scroll back and go to the beginning and listen to it that way. No, that's not correct. Incorrect, Tony. If I, like, if I understand correctly, 5646-117 is actually the reason we end up getting saved from it, or at least is supposed to be. Hell yeah! That's awesome, man! I love hearing that kind of stuff, dude. Alright, let's see. Let me go to recordings! What is this? This is Beast. Uh. Mm -hmm. Eight? Really? No. Beast Book 1, Chapter 8. Death Mage. Sounds awesome. Hey, that's a fun thing we could do for a little bit. Why don't we do some uh, some impressions? You guys tell me what you'd like me to impersonate, and I will do it. It can be a thing, a person, uh, an accent, a vocation, you know. See my vest. Yes, made of, see my vest made of gorilla, what was it? Made of gorilla che hair, made of a gorilla chest or something like that? See my vest made of a gorilla chest. Oh, water's excellent, you know. Oh, God. Oh, fuck! You guys! Oh, I'm so excited! I forgot about this! I get to read. I get to read thing that I like to read today. I love Travis Bagwell. Oh, I get my... This is mine! My early advance... Ah, early access copy. Fuck yes. Ooh, Smithers. Hmm. <sighs> uh, sir, I, uh... I think that maybe you need to be calm. Yes, 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 yes! I think I have an EPUB reader. I do. Okay, sick. Don't. <laughs> oh man, if you guys have not read Travis Bagwell's Awaken Online, do read it. 
Um, don't listen to the audiobook because um, David Steifel sucks ass. Like as as someone who wants to break into this, you know, this fucking world of reading books for a living, I clearly can do it because if David Steifel can, I can. Because that man's work is. I can't listen to the audiobooks anymore. Let's just put it that way. I stopped listening to the audiobooks after book two or three because I just couldn't anymore. Because his way of talking voices is all like this if it's a British person. And it's not good. Like, they're not good. Although he does have a certain quality that is easy to listen to, which is nice. Yeah, I read Mushoku Tensei, by the way. It was dope. Gorilla Cheats? <clears throat> what the fuck? Vert de Ferg. So this is a great series. I really like it. Hat Cat. Lofted Goffers? <laughs> Isn't it Gophers? Yeah, Awaken Online is dope. This is 10 days after the release. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a rundown of Awaken Online. It is a um, it is a lit RPG series by Travis Bagwell, who in his day job is, I believe, a tax attorney or something like that. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Um, but he's, he's a lawyer of some kind. Witch Mad Hatter. Because I can do the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland, I think. Oh boy, I will do the Mad Hatter from the the Alice of Wonderland. I change places. Berry of Poodle on my noodle. Well, now I need to know what the hell that is. I, buddy, I don't know what that one is. Is that? <laughs> My poodle's a noodle? I don't know what berry of poodle on my noodle is, dude. <laughs> oh! Okay. You're talking about the... Okay. 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 No. I'm not doing it. Beret of a poodle on my noodle? And it's not berry. It's beret. <laughs> God damn, guys, I'm really happy. Like, you don't understand. My videos are getting like a thousand views a piece, and that's that means so much to me. You don't understand. I am excited, Tony. At least I'm excited in so much as I will let myself be, because I'm not going to lie to you. What I have seen of it thus far has not exactly made me super enthusiastic. Um, I love The Wheel of Time. I'm a huge fan of Robert Jordan's works. I am going into this with the imagining, essentially, that there are neither beginnings nor endings to the wheel. This is just a beginning. So it can be a different turning of the wheel where Rand and company do things a little bit differently. And that's... That's what I'm telling myself so that I don't become extraordinarily disappointed with what looks to be so far a very CW product like you know the flash on the CW or green arrow or like some of the shitty shows they have on the CW I'm not a fan of it's very mm, I just hope it's not schlocky garbage mm. But yeah, Awaken Online's awesome. It's lit RPG. Basically, it's the first real, like, immersive virtual reality game where it's like full dive and SAO. Wait, King Candy? I'm King Candy! I think I know who you're talking about. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. From uh, from fucking, from fucking uh, Wreck It Ralph. Yeah, King Candy. Ralph, listen to me. She's a glitch. She's not supposed to exist. Turbotastic. Yeah, no, I <laughs> Severus Snape. Ooh, Severus Snape. Okay, so turn to page two. So, Mr. Potter, let's dick, sir. I am excited for Wheel of Time. That's going to be great. Oh, Dominic's last name is Hart. Okay, so that, that goes. Makes sense. Yeah. How confusion are you? I know, but, like, the thing is, is that this turning looks like a bunch of CW garbage. Like, I'm really pissed off at the, the stills that I have seen of the White Cloak's armor. It shouldn't look like that. Unless, unless that's the armor of the Red Hand. I could understand that since they're not really a combat unit. They are Inquisitors, you know, or not the Red Hand, the Red, the red Crook, the, the Inquisitors. I can understand that being like a ceremonial thing or something like that. Anger from inside out. I actually don't remember. Is that just Jack? Is that just uh, Lewis Black? I'm pretty sure it was just Lewis Black. Let me look it up. Anger from. <laughs> Let's listen to this real quick. Ever wonder why you feel the way you do? Ever wonder why you feel the way you do? We'll get to know your emotions. When things go wrong, anger is there. This is anger. He will make sure... He will make sure... Sure, the world knows anger is in control. But what you really... Yeah, it's just, I think it was just played by Lewis Black, wasn't it? What are we talking about? Well, a few different things. Um, Lewis Black, I was right. Yes, I remembered something. Oh, when I did the Mad Hatter, yeah, it's, it definitely sounded like King Candy. They kind of have that same sort of sound, though, I think. I'm late, I'm late for a very important date. Oh, I'm late. I'm late for a very important date. I did not. Bowl O. Googleness. Katie got the getta. You know what's really great about exercise is it makes you feel better. You know what's really shitty about exercise is it makes you feel bad for like a day afterwards because everything hurts. Oh, uh, when is the repeated bout uh, effect going to take effect? God damn it. I'm tired of being sore. The doms are not nearly as bad as they were. Like my arms, my arms feel like a lot better than they did. Like, and I'm, I recover a lot easier, but. Oh, 
I can also do Gollum. <clears throat> How was that, buddy? The rock and pearl is nice and cool, so juicy, sweet. I only wish to catch a fish, so juicy, sweet. To bang his bones upon the rock, so juicy, sweet. And they doesn't taste very nice, does they? What's... What's Tatus Brushes? Elm, Elm. I used to do that for fun uh, when I was a kid. It's a really fun impression to do because it's it's it uses parts of your throat that you don't fucking use. You put all of the the sounds in here. <laughs> yeah, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired, Rigel. I have so I was at two fifty and now I'm below two hundred. So. I at my I, I haven't been at my heaviest for like a couple of years, but I I think I was two seventeen and now I'm like two ninety eight. Sorry, not two ninety eight, one ninety eight. So I'm pretty happy about that, and I've been working out a lot. I've been I got a a bar and like a a bench down in the garage just so I could do that. Parcel tongue. <laughs> That's how I think uh, parcel tongue what it sounds like. I can't remember. Um, oh, oh my goodness. Welcome to the Quickie Mart. How may I help you? Would you like a squishy? Would you like a squishy? Um... Yeah, I would. They do kind of sound alike. The I think the big difference, Rigel, is that in the movies, in the in the Lord of the Rings, there's so much more of a layering effect. You know what I mean? Which I just can't achieve without editing. But the parcel tongue, yeah, would definitely sound similar in that case. Uncle Iroh is one of my favorite voices to do. Zuko, it is time for you to look inside yourself and find and ask yourself, who do you want to be? I love Uncle Iroh. Oh, God. That scene where he's singing to his son, where it's technically, I guess, his son singing to him, really, Brave soldier boy leaves from the vine. Oh man, I'm tearing up just thinking about that. <laughs> In breathing for dark speech, yeah, that one's fun. I re- you know what I really liked? If you guys haven't seen it, the in Dune, the Sardaukar speech is fucking phenomenal. <laughs> That's what it sounds like to me. Man, oh, Dune was so good, you guys. Um, actually, I'm pretty sure that I can use motherfucking... Um, if you guys don't have HBO Max, I think that I could use um, Discord to stream that today if you guys want to watch it. Because um, I am 100% down. Five, six, four, six. No spoilers? Oh, I'm not going to spoil nothing. I'm not going to spoil a damn thing about Dune. I love that story. Although I will say that it has been out since the 70s. (laughs) Reading is good. (laughs) But God, it was so good. Oh. Oh. 
Oh. All right, guys. Since this has been released, though, I, I did forget about it. I am going to... Hold on. There's this motherfucker. Mmm, this makes me mad a little bit. So it's only a fucking bonus epilogue. Luck proc. All right. All right, I'm going to have to read this from the beginning because he basically changed. Shy Hulud. Honestly, Fatima, either. The Denis Villeneuve um, version is pretty true to the books. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't take a ton of license and change stuff. He, he does a pretty good job of staying true to the themes of the book. There's some stuff he leaves out because even though it is a two and a hour and 45 minute movie... It, it can't include everything that a book can. You know what I mean? There's just too much texture in a book. Um, I will say, though, it is a slick, beautiful, gorgeous soundtrack. The whole cast is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, Timothy Chalamet is ah, chef's kiss. Like, I don't understand any of the reviews from people who say he can't emote. He emotes beautifully. In that movie. And um, I actually was really impressed with Jason Momoa. He did a phenomenal fucking job. I loved I loved uh, Lynch's version. Like, David Lynch is a fucking crazy motherfucker. And some of the shit, like the heart keys that he included, are odd choices. But, yeah. Uh, anyway, guys, I think I am going to get off of here. Go do some reading. I will talk to you all later. Uh, I love you all. Thank you for being here. And, uh, yeah. Looking for the patron Patreon? Go down that. Do whatever you want, okay? Um, I hope you guys all have a great day. Here and uh, yeah, looking for the patron Patreon? Go down that. Do whatever you want, okay? Um, I hope you guys all have a great day. Here and uh, yeah, looking.